This video is brought to you by Audible. Neil Young did not need Crosby, Stills, and Nash. In 1969, Neil was just a struggling, up-and-coming solo artist when his old buddy Stephen Stills invited him to join Crosby, Stills, and Nash, the hottest new band in America. They were rock's first supergroup, all coming from their own successful bands, and their debut album that year had already made them stars. But when Crosby, Stills, and Nash became Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, that's when they really blew up. Deja Vu, their second album and first one as a quartet, is still considered some of the greatest classic rock ever made, an era-defining record of peace and love and war and death. By 1970, after just two short years, they were the biggest names in music. But the thing about Neil Young is he does whatever the fuck he wants. And even though CSNY was the vehicle where he first became a star, he was always more committed to his solo career. He did still tour with the band over the years, but any attempts to get Neil back in the studio would quickly fizzle and die. With the other members also pretty dysfunctional and only intermittently cooperating, a full band reunion with Neil seemed less and less likely, especially as he grew far more acclaimed and successful than the other three. Well, I got bored and left them there. They were just dead weight to me. By the end of the 70s, it seemed that Neil's attitude was, You're a bunch of washed up hippie burnouts, and I'm Neil fucking Young. So for almost two decades, Deja Vu would be their only album with Neil and the band. And yet, as our story begins in the late 80s, it is actually Crosby, Stills, and Nash who'd had the more recent success. Neil has spent the decade making wacky genre experiments so uncommercial and unsellable that he got sued by his own label. CSN, meanwhile, had had a major hit record in 82 with their yacht rockish fourth album, Daylight Again. Think about how many times But they haven't kept up the momentum either. That's largely due to the substance problems of David Crosby, who, through the mid-80s, goes on a wild, old, dirty, bastard-esque spree of drugs and mayhem. David Crosby, formerly of the group Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, was arrested by West Palm Beach Police. It seemed likely that there would never be another CSNY album, not because Neil was stubborn, but because Crosby would surely be dead. But during Crosby's lowest moments, Neil made a promise to his dear friend. If David could get himself clean, Neil would rejoin the band and make a new record. Amazingly, and with the help of some prison time, Crosby did in fact kick the habit. And Neil was good to his word. Longtime fans rejoiced. It took a miracle of friendship and perseverance, but Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young had reunited at last with a brand new album, American Dream. The hype was real. And when the record finally dropped, the anticipation was through the roof. The sales were fantastic, and the reviews were terrible. I really rather not discuss it. We really didn't get together. We were just in the same area. It didn't work. You know how you got old friends from back home, and you're always like, yeah, we should hang out again. Let's do a trip. Let's go camping or something. But you never do? There's a reason. Don't know where things went wrong. A lot changes in 20 years, and for CSNY, decades of dysfunction couldn't be put away. So the result was an incoherent, overproduced piece of crap that Neil Young's own biographer called the most wretched album he ever made. Considering the shit Neil was making in the 80s, that is some statement. God, such a perfect setup for the feel-good comeback of the 80s. Just completely wasted on the way. The American dream dies. Cause these fat old hippies killed it. This is Train Records. We all know people who, despite their skill, talent, and opportunity to succeed, just never live up to their potential. They are their own worst enemies. Crosby, Stills, and Nash are exactly that. When you ask any fan what made Crosby, Stills, and Nash such a great band, Always the first thing mentioned is the harmonies. Lay your body. Which is ironic, because CSN were always a very disharmonious band. And I'll call my partner in and trash the f out of you. Now get your f guitar on and stop cool. fucking around. And that's assuming you can even call them a band at all. The group is named after all the members because they've always insisted that they are separate solo artists and their work together was always a temporary side project. This is why, after 19 years, the band had only made four albums. 
the rest of their time being spent on separate projects, solo records, failed reunions, excessive drug use, and lots and lots of squabbling. Including a zany period where they split into two separate duos. So with the band this combative and past their prime, you'd think no one would have cared if they reunited. But you'd be wrong. In fact, the late 80s were a great time to be an over-the-hill rock star. There were boomer icons all over the place, still making big hits and everyone just pretending they were still vital and relevant in their puffy middle age. So you see these guys, they are obviously not young and fresh. Crosby's gone bald, Stills has gotten fat, Nash has grown this truly heinous mullet. Like, you know, the 40-something sports coat and sunglasses mullet that's all poofy on top. Ugh, terrible. Well, even so, believe it or not, they are still very much a viable commercial proposition. Especially with Neil back in the band. Neil's return was the entire selling point of the album, and he's a famously fickle man. He once abandoned Stills in the middle of a tour by quitting on the spot and disappearing. So Neil called the shots for this record. They made it with his people at his place because everyone knew Neil could and would tank the entire project if he got annoyed, frustrated, or bored. So why don't we look at his songs first? Here we begin with the album opener, title track, and first single, American Dream. Truly, this will launch CSNY's triumphant return. In their heyday, CSNY wrote a number of great protest songs. So this one is also timely social commentary. It's about the rise and scandalous fall of someone important, probably inspired by a whole mess of sex scandals in the late 80s, many of which are referenced in the music video. I have sinned against you, my lord. Classic. So Young is writing about all these famous falls as commentary on America. So, uh, yeah, this wasn't a hit. I'm not sure why, it's not like the worst thing ever, but it doesn't really work. Okay, first off, I think saying American Dream over and over again is both a weak hook and weak social commentary. I've always kind of had a problem with the way we just stick the word America on everything. Like, maybe not everything that happens in this giant-ass country says something about America. The American Dream is, you know, rising up from poverty. Anyone can make it here. A senator tanking his presidential campaign by cheating on his wife. Like, I'm sure it says something about something, but these famous men being brought down by sex scandals... I don't know, maybe that just represents that they're morons. But that's not my real problem. My problem is that I just don't understand what tone it's going for. Hey guys, I've written a song about how the American dream is a failure and a lie, and I think it should sound like a commercial for a water park. From above. A year before the reunion, Neil was performing an early version of this song on tour, and the acoustic version sounds much better. This version has sharper lyrics and an actual point. It's much sadder and also kind of sounds self-directed. Considering all four members were at a career low, turning this song into self-commentary instead of political commentary could have been much more interesting. Instead, it just sounds shallow and smug, and all the political references in the video, it's like it's trying to suggest a point without actually having one. I have no idea why this is the direction they went with it. Again, pan flutes? What do you even know about it, Neil? You're Canadian. Well, anyway, Neil's second song on here is called Name of Love. I actually like the melody of this one a lot, but lyrically, it's one of the dumber songs he ever wrote. It's a message to the leaders and politicians of the world that whatever they do, they should do it in the name of love. The whole 
point of Neil being in the band was that he brought a hard, gnarly edge that they didn't have without him. That's what he should be bringing now. Instead, he brings... Can he do it in the name of love? What kind of flower power bullshit is this? Imagine Reagan sitting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff being like, well, uh, gentlemen, before we invade Honduras, I think we should ask, are we doing this in the name of love? Midnight, that old clock keeps ticking. And another protest song from him. This one's a little better. It's called This Old House. See, in the mid-80s, there was a big farm crisis. A lot of small farmers were having their homes repossessed. So Neil wrote this gentle country song about the pain of having the man repossess your house. And I don't want to wake you up when I close the door. Understated but powerful, that's more like the vintage Neil. See, that's good stuff. I like how this rolls. This old house of ours is built up. What the fuck? Why are the harmonies so loud? And a businessman don't know. What that means. Like this song and the last one. Even just looking at this waveform, it looks very wrong. I, I wish I knew anything about audio engineering so I could go in depth on this, but basically everyone agrees. A big problem with this album is it just sounds bad. I guess they know that the whole reason you buy a CSN album is for the harmonies, so they just hammer that button on every chorus and it gets old very quick. But also they're just mixed wrong or something. They sound artificial and they fill up the entire song like someone's vacuuming the house while you're trying to watch TV. Because of the circumstances, the guys had to let Neil be in charge. But the problem with that is that at the time, Neil was making the worst shit of his life. After his own label sued him, Neil made an attempt to drop the experimental stuff and go mainstream. But the result sounded even more like a failed experiment than ever. This seems like just a very dark time for Neil Young. He seems to have no idea how to deal with the 80s. So many of the production choices on this album are baffling. Neil has at least mostly given up on the synthesizers, but as we'll see, the rest of the band was not that smart. Well, that was Neil. Let us move on from him and go on to Stephen Stills, the engine of the group. A ferociously talented musical dynamo. He played all the instruments on the first album. Unfortunately, with Crosby sober, Stills has now taken up the role of band fuck-up. I like uh, to party, all right? Right. He is drinking all the time, which, can you tell? You know, I really love fine wine and good scotch, and, and uh, that's the end of that. For some reason, none of the songs he brought to the sessions were done, meaning that Neil had to come in and finish them. But you know, he's here, so we'll give him a listen. Stills' first song in the album is called Got It Made. And I would say it's the best song on the album. Comes the closest to figuring out a way to make this band fit into the late 80s, which by that I mean it sounds like a late period Fleetwood Mac song. Not the best era of Mac, but certainly worthwhile. The band does hit the everybody harmonize button on the chorus yet again, but uh, yeah, I think this is pretty good. And this song did get some play on the foggy rock stations, making it the album's biggest hit. This was the only song on the record to crack the Hot 100. It's fine. And that's a good thing for Stills that he has the one hit, because every other song he writes is shockingly bad. I can't stop thinking down her, cause she's mighty fine. And it would be like if I didn't speak up now. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm ready to choose that girl. Love that girl, she's so fine. D D D da da da. Hey Neil, come finish this one for me. This is not just bad; it's amateur. If a 22-year-old wrote this song, you tell them to go get a real job, because songwriting is clearly not in their future. Like here's another one Stills wrote: a rocker called Driving Thunder. Okay, 
one, this sounds like a goddamn beer commercial. Which is funny, since Neil had just released a song about how he hates beer commercials. Two, are you seriously trying to write your own I Can't Drive 55? That's a young man song. In your mid-40s, it just sounds like a midlife crisis. What? CSNY were a bunch of earnest, up-their-ass hippies. They were a lot of things, but ZZ Top, they were not. Watching them trying to be loose and freewheeling is like watching your drunk dad dance at a wedding. Even Nash, who's the only person to say anything nice about this album, even he's like, well, I like my song. Stills were all fucking shit. Well, Nash, you got a lot of shit to say about Stills. Why don't we move on to you? So, become yourself. Graham Nash, the tender-hearted British gentleman of the group. The only one who doesn't seem like a giant pain in the ass. CSN were never really a pop group, but the few crossover hits they've had were mostly written by him. If anyone's gonna write a big comeback single for this band, it is probably Graham Nash. But, unfortunately, like so many of his generation, by the late 80s, he has become sellout yuppie scum. Never leave me alone. Don't say I don't want to face my world without you. Going for that Richard Marks money, I see. We were fighting the all of our lives, and now fighting. Nash's ambitions to be the next Peter Cetera are palpable and pathetic, and it's sad to see one of the great protest bands of the 60s reduced to making glop like this. But he's got some social commentary here. Here's a tribute to the Vietnam vets, returned home but spiritually still forever lost in the Asian jungles. It's called Shadowland. Fuck out of here with this. Behind a nation's blind salute, behind my country, tis of the shadow land. Honestly, I'd be okay with the na 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 if this were like a goofy song like Africa or Turning Japanese, but this is a serious song about Nam. He really thinks he's doing something here, and it's so corny. Back in People who think the 80s were so great, no, most of it sounded like this. Overproduced slogs of synth by old men. Also, is it just me or do none of these songs have anything to do with each other? Like there's a reason I'm separating these songs by band member. None of them sound like they were made by the same people. For all the troubles, the band always sounded like a unit before. But not only are all these songs lame, they're all lame in completely separate ways. When they harmonize, it's like they're only doing it so they can still pretend they're a real band. And finally, we have David Crosby, the ultimate rock and roll survivor. The one with the best narrative, the comeback story of the 80s. Also generally considered the band's weakest songwriter. And he's in terrible health after years of self-abuse, so he spends most of the recording sessions taking a nap. And he only contributes two songs, not that I'm complaining. It's a song about finding your way. His most notable contribution is Compass, a song about his years lost to drugs. I have wasted ten years. From the reviews I've seen, this song is either the best or the worst song on the album. It's either a haunting look at the time he lost to addiction, or it's a meandering tuneless bore. Seeking norm. Well, you know me. I like hooks. If someone thinks this song is great, I won't argue. It didn't do anything for me. But he has another song. He wrote his own protest song, Nighttime for the Generals. This song is a powerful look at the dark specter looming over the entire 80s. And that specter is Don Henley. Up prisoners and putting them in a pen. I mean, I guess it's about the CIA or something, but it sounds just like Don Henley. 
that makes like the eighth different artist they've tried to sound like on this record and failed. Have you tried sounding like Crosby, Stills and Nash for Christ's sakes? Another big problem with the album? It's 14 songs long. Even though there is definitely not 14 songs worth of material. If I had to guess, maybe Neil wanted four songs and then everyone else wanted four songs also. It's just a slog. So I'm happy to announce that we are at the final song. It's from Stills, and it's called Night Song. Hold on, I think I'm playing the wrong video footage over this. There we go. Like, you can tell none of them even want to make this instantly dated 80s crapola. Like, their voices aren't even blending anymore. You can just hear how exhausted everyone is at the end of this, and how much they don't want to be in the room with each other. Well, I can think of many reasons why. Well, that was the end of the American Dream. The reunion flopped hard. CSNY did a couple benefit concerts, but after that, Neil once again fucked off to Nowheresville, leaving the other three holding their dicks. In fact, he didn't even rejoin with them on the album cover, he had to be photoshopped in. With no Neil, there could be no tour, and thus no promotion, meaning most of these songs have never been performed live, or once or twice at most. Even with no tour, the album still went platinum, but at least one source I read said that since basically all sales measurements in the 80s were fraudulent, you can take that with a grain of salt. Once the album was done, all four members completely forgot about this record and never performed any of these songs ever again. Within a year of completing American Dream, Neil would write some of the best songs of his career and have a major revival. A lot of people speculate that Neil had lost interest in American Dream before it even started and was hoarding all his good material for himself. I mean, he only made the album as a promise to his junky friend that he probably didn't even expect to survive long enough to call it in. I kinda suspect Neil would've just bailed on the album and gone home if they weren't recording it at his home. Over the next couple years, he would become a beloved elder statesman to a new generation of alt-rockers. Meanwhile, Crosby, Stills & Nash just puttered onward as legacy artists for a few decades, sometimes with Neil, but mostly without, before once again breaking up acrimoniously, presumably for the final time. The four men have rarely agreed on anything since, except for two things. One, that they would boycott Spotify because they hate Joe Rogan so much, and two, that American Dream is a piece of shit that shouldn't have been made. But is it really that bad? I would say personally that a couple of the Neil Young albums before this are even worse. And the CSN album right after this, the infamous Hot Dog album, that one might be worse too. But of their records, American Dream is the most unsalvageable. To be charitable, they're a band that was too honest and real to ever sell out. To be meaner, they were completely unable to modernize their sound. Right after this, a bunch of classic rock legends made their own supergroup that was actually pretty good. So it could have been done, but these guys just never had the discipline to do it. CSN remains such a Nixon era proposition to me that trying to bring them back just seems stupid. Teach your children well. And especially teach them that records made entirely out of emotional obligation with guys you can't stand anymore doesn't work. Peace and love, y'all. And while I have a moment, can I talk to you about Audible? Now, I read a lot of books for the extensive research I do for all these episodes. For this episode, I extensively consulted the biography Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young by David Brown, which I highly recommend. And you can listen to it right now on Audible, as well as gain access to thousands of other titles and podcasts on every subject. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. And you'll discover exclusive Audible originals from top celebrities, renowned experts, and exciting new voices in audio. Audible also includes thousands of podcasts from popular favorites to exclusive new series. Members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, audio originals, and podcasts. You can download or stream their included titles all you want. 
The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, while traveling, working out, walking, doing chores, you decide. To try it out for yourself, visit audible.com slash Todd in the Shadows or text Todd in the Shadows to 500-500. Click now. Thank you and good night.